<laughs> Fabulous. Okay, um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Joey Kane. I'm president of the Calamus um, Board of Directors. Calamus is a co-sponsor of the event tonight. Uh, this is part of a series that we call Faggot Sensibility, an exploration of gay queer men's consciousness. Uh, we, do, we were doing about two, uh, two events a month. We're probably going to go to one event a month for the coming year. And I just wanted to give some uh, folks some idea of what the faggot sensibility part of Calamus will be doing. Uh, we'll be, we're going to be showing some films, including the film Everlasting Secret Family, which is a delightful film about homosexuals controlling the whole government in Australia <laughs> from the 80s. It's kind of fabulous. And uh, in, in lieu of recent events, we're going to be doing a Zsa, Zsa Gabor film evening uh, oh. featuring Queen of Outer Space, yes, yes. of course, yes. and Touch of Evil, because we've got to have a great film to go with Queen of Outer Space. Um, we'll, in the coming year, we'll also be uh, having a presentation on Walt Whitman's Calamus poems and the birth of gay consciousness, a uh, presentation on Uranian science fiction, uh, queer visions of time, space, and the future, a uh, presentation on early gay pioneer, uh, socialist, and radical thinker Edward Carpenter. And uh, starting in April, uh, Calamus is going to be a co-sponsor of an exhibit that's going to be here at uh, the library called uh, Lavender Tinted Glasses, a groovy gay look at the summer of love 1967, <laughs> mm. uh, which I'll be curious. Uh, so those are some things Calamus has coming up. We also, on the third Saturday of the month, yes? yes. Thank you, darling. Uh, we do a, a, a show, a drag show, and a dance party at... Club OMG on 6th and Market. And uh, we're also doing some events over in the East Bay. So if you're an East Bay person, we're going to be doing some stuff there. I'm going to pass this around. If you're interested, I still do email lists. I can't deal with Facebook, although we do have people who do Facebook. If you'd like to get on the Calamus uh, email list to get sent when we're doing events, I'm going to pass this around. And uh, you can sign up. If you want to start over here, uh, just pass it along. Um, and uh, with no further ado, I do want to thank Gerard, who is his offer to do this for us tonight. Yes. But before we bring in Gerard, uh, I want to introduce Terry Beswick, who is the executive director of the Museum and Historical Society. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, Terry Beswick, I'm with the Historical Society, and I'm very excited that we're going to be uh, hosting uh, Joey's show here uh, through Labrador uh, Tinted Glasses, uh, the 50th anniversary of Summer of Love. It's in conjunction with a, a number of other exhibits around uh, Summer of Love that are happening throughout the city this coming spring on the 50th anniversary. And, uh, and I'm sure we're going to have a very queer uh, uh, interpretation of that, uh, that series of events. It was a very queer, actually, uh, event when you think about it. <laughs> that term may, may not have been used. Anyway, so um, I just wanted to welcome everybody here. I wanted to ask, how uh, is everyone here a member of the Historical Society? Can you raise your hand if you're a member? Okay, well, there's uh, about 50% that don't have to feel a lot of shame right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's only $50 a year, and it's $30 for low-income and students, and it's really our bread and butter. It's what allows us to continue uh, this work here in the museum and in the archives downtown. We're in a growth phase. Uh, this year, we're uh, ending the year at about 50% higher than what we uh, concluded last year, and the next year, we're going to do the same. And so we're very excited about that. We're adding additional staff, additional programs, um, if you follow us, you know that we have a, one or two events here every week, um, and the use of the archives is increasing at, at, a, at a much greater pace. Uh, and I feel like the, the work that we're doing is so important right now in this time. Uh, we don't, our, our future is kind of in an uncertain place, I, I think it'd be fair to say. And it's so important for us because uh, disenfranchised communities need to really, like, stick together and understand the uh, overlapping concerns that we have so that we can kind of turn the situation around. I think uh, yeah, politically in the United States right now, God, the Electoral College just screwed up today. And I was <laughs> um, 
So, you know, uh, I, I don't think this is a time to be shy or, or to be reluctant to, to state what our, our political leanings are. And it's a time for us to really speak out. And it's a time for us to reflect on what our history has been as mm -hmm. a human race and the signs, the early signs that can lead us to a, a place where people like us uh, can lose our basic human rights. And so uh, that's why this exhibit is so important and why the work that the Historical Society and organizations like us, and there's so few organizations that do the work that we do around the world. Uh, we've just launched something called Vision 2020, and um, it's a campaign. It's the, it's the precursor to a capital campaign that I hope that we announce in the next year to build a, a full-fledged, world-class museum for the homosexuals among us. <laughs> uh, and the LGBTQ community and all of our diversity, I think it's important that we have a space that can do adequate justice to the diverse stories that, that comprise our community. And so, where is it going to be? We don't know exactly yet, but I'm working on it uh, with city officials who are working on trying to identify a space. Um, and I, I think we're going to do it. And the thing is that we have to have the vision and we have to have the commitment and those $50 memberships help, help us to get there. We have a $30,000 challenge grant uh, through the end of the year for every don new donation that we get above what you gave last year. Uh, uh, will qualify for a match, and and we're we're well on course to meeting that match, and so please, uh, as you're considering where to give your money, there's so many worthy causes, but uh, think about giving a little bit extra to the historical society. Um, Gerard, I've known for 25, 30 years or so, uh, and uh, hanging around this neighborhood mostly. And I'm excited to introduce him tonight. He's uh, one of the founding members of the Historical Society. Um, for me, he really exemplifies what it means to be a community historian and, and an activist historian who uh, values the importance of collecting the individual stories and, and, the, and the data and sharing that and conveying it to other people. And so he's been a huge help to me uh, to um, uh, embrace the work that we do and to help to articulate uh, how important the work is that we do. Um, and, you know, so we talk, we talk uh, pretty regularly almost every day. Uh, I got some snarky email from him. <laughs> so it's always very helpful. Only when he's <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I'm very privileged to work with Gerard and with the wonderful team that we have here on our staff and our board and our our volunteers that are the lifeblood of the organization. And I love this exhibit, so with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Gerard Hoskins. So let me welcome you all to the museum. Uh, it's really marvelous having this space here in the Castro. Is as Terry emphasized, and I'd really like to encourage all of you who are not yet members, please consider joining. This is a place where we bring together two crucial visions, a vision of the value of public history and of learning from our past, and a vision of how that can inform our struggles for social justice and our dreams for the future. Mm -hmm. And this exhibition uh, that I curated uh, is sadly exceptionally timely mm -hmm. uh, and inspiring in many ways, I think you'll see. It's troubling, it's deeply painful in parts, but it's quite inspiring. Um, what I'd like to do this evening is think of this more as a kind of informal tour. I don't want to give a, a lecture, and at, some, at certain points I'll ask anybody who would like to come up and look a bit more closely at some of the objects in the exhibition. It's really a kind of personal and informal introduction uh, as the curator and as a collector who's gathered all but one of the historical items that you see on display here, I've been collecting for over 30 years focused on LGBTQ history, uh, I really have a number of stories that I'd like to tell that extend beyond the very succinct overview we could present in the show uh, and that move uh, to uh, a, a little bit broader knowledge of some of the things that you're seeing here and a little bit more personal picture of some of them. So let me just say that for the structure of the evening, I'll talk a little bit about what makes this exhibition distinctive in the framework of our work here at the GLBT History Museum and the Historical Society. Then I'll highlight a few aspects of Hirschfeld's work and life by zeroing in on some of the objects on display and the ways that they provide a representation and a touchstone for those stories. 
Uh, then I'll point out a couple of items that have particular stories for me as a collector or have some further uh, information that is not readily evident and that there wasn't room to put in a little mm -hmm. label but that you might find interesting. And finally, as the special uh, dessert to our meal, I'll show a small handful of items from my collection that we didn't have room to include in the mm -hmm. show, but they're really quite amazing in their own right. Uh, so let's, and let me say, of course, that this won't be a formal presentation, so I'll be stopping at numerous points to invite questions, comments, insights. I'm as eager to learn from you as I am to share some of what I know with you, and I find that these sorts of talks always help me clarify my thinking and come to a deeper understanding of topics that I'm passionate about. So first, what makes this a distinctive exhibition in the framework of our work uh, at the museum? First, it's our first exhibition that focuses entirely on the period before World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, our archives do extend back to the 19th century in part. Uh, they focus largely on Northern California, but certainly the era before World War II is not the richest part of our holdings. Uh, so in this case, it's a chance to look farther back in time than we normally have been able to look in a somewhat sustained way. Secondly, uh, it's, although quite small, it's a show that's international in scope. If you haven't yet had a chance to look closely, I'll be pointing out a few of the things and do come back and, and look closely at the exhibition. There are materials in four or five different languages. There are materials from half a dozen different countries. Uh, it really looks worldwide. And speaking of different languages, languages other than English, this is also the first time we've done a show where the majority of the material on display features texts that are not in English. And that really causes us to raise some questions. This isn't a university library where people are used to seeing uh, lots of text in languages they may not be able to read. So we wondered whether this would work with our people. Of course, we emphasized <coughs> lots of visual material. And the brief texts help you plunge into to what's written there. So you don't need to read those foreign languages. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt. Uh, and that, in fact, has been demonstrated by the fact that we've had the show open in August, our high tourist season, when we have lots of visitors from outside of the United States. And we had numerous visitors from France, from Germany. At the opening, we had a, a staffer for the Goethe Institute, who is actually of Turkish origin. So she was amazed to see a publication in Turkish in the show, uh, and to see that Hirschfeld's word had even reached as far as Turkey. Again, troubling today to think about that progressive moment there. So I think it actually worked. It demonstrated that our public is willing to, to see shows that might seem a little challenging at first uh, if we present them in a way that makes them accessible. Uh, and again, I think those two things, pre-World War II, from numerous countries in languages other than English, it sends a kind of subtextual message. Our movement has been around for a long time in a lot of places. Uh, it's faced a lot of challenges, and we're still here, and we're not going anywhere except forward, which was always Hirschfeld's message. Uh, finally, it's unusual because it's based almost entirely on a private collection. This one little sort of canary yellow magazine right here is the only thing from our archives and the rest are materials that I brought together. And I think that that actually is interesting because it's enabled us to tell stories that we couldn't tell with our archives. And it also opens up a possibility for working with other collectors just here in the Bay Area. I know of major collectors who focus on transgender materials, on drag materials, on leather and SM, on lesbian photography, on gay photography. We have a lot of very passionate collectors of LGBTQ history and culture whose collections go beyond what we can do just with our archives. So here we got an international show without having to pay to bring all this material over from Germany and France and, and whatnot. So I hope we continue to, to look at that as a possible model. Now let's take a look at some, and, and first, any questions about that sort of snapshot of why this is unusual for the museum? Any ideas, questions, comments? All right, let's roll on then. Uh, just to look at four themes that we can pull out of the exhibition beyond the way it's currently presented by looking at some of the objects. I want to open by saying that the exhibition, we put thought of it and put it together because this year is the 85th anniversary of Hirschfeld's visit to San Francisco. He came to San Francisco from February 24th to March 5th, 1931. Uh, at the end of his tour of the United States, that was the start of a worldwide lecture tour that lasted almost two years. Uh, and uh, when he came to San Francisco, he clearly loved the city. His memoirs of his world tour, which you see in this first case here, 
when a man and women, or women east and west, the publishers in the English language translations decided to make it a little more appealing to straight people. <laughs> and indeed, he talks about the wide range of sexual practices and identities. Uh, in German, it's called the World Tour of a Sexologist, same mm -hmm. in French. Uh, but it was originally published in German uh, in Switzerland. Uh, the Nazis had already taken over by the time the book was published. The opening line of Hirschfeld's memoirs, this tells you how impressed he was with San Francisco. The opening line is, I'm here in the fabulously beautiful harbor of San Francisco. Uh, he is struck by the visual beauty of this city, uh, by its, its unusual landscape, by its charm. And um, he spent his time here, calling in the media and in a series of five different public lectures over 10 days for sex education, for reproductive rights and for support for women and mothers, particularly poor women and mothers, but, and for an understanding of homosexuality. He gave one talk for the San Francisco Medical Society specifically on that topic. More broadly, Hirschfeld was a real progressive at that point. He called for an end to the death penalty. He called for an end to prohibition, saying that he originally had supported it because he was himself not a drinker of alcohol and had seen the damage that it caused, but he recognized that it was a short-sighted, ill-considered public policy that led to an enormous amount of crime mm -hmm. and corruption, and that in fact that was worse and there were other ways of dealing with problems of substance use. Uh, so he called for an end to prohibition. He also called for penal reform, uh, again, a topic that we are very aware of in California, and he pointed out particularly that putting people in prison imposed various kinds of misery that nobody deserved, and he talked particularly about sexual misery. Uh, and as part of his study of this topic, he went to San Quentin, and he visited with Tom Mooney, the falsely imprisoned anarchist uh, organizer who had been sent to jail for life at an anarchist bombing, and later was demonstrated that he was framed, that he was nowhere near there, that the police knew that this was, was false. Uh, and uh, Hirschfeld went to support Tom Mooney, this political prisoner, and to talk with him about the misery of prisoners being isolated from the normal fabric of human life and how that damaged not only prisoners but, but society more broadly. Uh, Hirschfeld gave uh, a talk, one of his talks, and this really touched me, he gave one of his talks at California Hall, which I didn't know. Mm -hmm. For those of you who know San Francisco history, in 1965, California, in 1964, New Year's Eve 64, New Year's Day 65, California Hall was the site of a massive police raid on a fundraising drag ball uh, for the Council on Religion and the Homosexual, and the Queens all stood up to the cops and said, we don't think so, and it was a real turning point uh, when the media started saying, why are police doing this to gay people? It's stupid. It really was a real key moment in San Francisco's history. So it touched me deeply that Hirschfeld had given a talk there uh, about the sexual misery of our time uh, 40 years earlier, uh, sort of a double historic site. Hirschfeld also did a little tourism. He loved Chinatown, Twin Peaks, Telegraph Hill, and in the Mission District, he visited Mission Dolores, and he quality <laughs> on Albion Street, which was the headquarters of the German Working Men's Educational Association, a socialist uh, cultural and educational organization founded by German immigrants. Uh, the building is still there. Later, from 1975 to 1987, it was the home of Dr. Tom Waddell, the founder of the Gay Games, another double queer historic site. More recently, it was on the market for $6.7 million. <laughs> <laughs> that was a swanky mansion, just in case you have any loose change yeah. <laughs> sitting around in your uh, sofa cushions. Uh, so I think that we can really be proud that Hirschfeld visited us here in San Francisco, loved our city, and, and highlighted its beauty in the opening lines of his memoirs. Uh, let's also look at the real meat of Hirschfeld's work and his contribution, his, his lifelong advocacy for homosexual people and transgender people. So uh, we can look at two things in the exhibition that really highlight these things. We'll start with this little pamphlet here, this little gray pamphlet that says, we'll translate it, what should people know about the third sex? Uh, a, uh, an educational uh, text about same-sex loving homosexual men or people. The term is a little unclear. Uh, and you'll see that it really was men at the beginning there. Uh, Hirschfeld was the founder of the, of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, the first 
organization to advocate for rights for homosexual people. It was founded in 1897 in Berlin. This little pamphlet went through numerous editions starting in 1901. It was the main advocacy tool that the, that the committee used. Thousands of copies were handed out, uh, basically to enlighten people about what it meant to be a homosexual and to call for repeal of paragraph 175 of the German sodomy law that specifically targeted homosexual men or male same-sex sodomy. Uh, we're in the... And so the Scientific Humanitarian Committee uh, continued this work basically arguing for legal equality and arguing for social understanding of homosexual people and arguing for homosexual people to understand and respect themselves. Hirschfeld's argument as a scientist, as a sexologist, a physician was homosexual desire is a natural human variation. It's not a sin, it's not a crime, it's not a disease, and the only problem with it is the way that society regards it and abuses queer folk. And so the committee worked for almost 40 years to try to advocate that point of view uh, and um, it had a wide, a wide impact. Uh, notably, it had branches that opened in other countries. In 1908, a branch opened in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, here in the United States, the first homosexual rights organization in 1924, the Society for Human Rights in Chicago, founded by Henry Gerber. Gerber was German-American, had done his service uh, in the occupation army after World War I in Germany and became familiar with the work of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee and said, well, I'm going to go back to the United States and start a group like that. So Hirschfeld directly inspired Gerber. They may have met when Hirschfeld gave a lecture during his week-long stay in Chicago in 1931. Uh, and we know that, Hirsch, that Gerber carried on Hirschfeld's memory. This little orange magazine here is the One Institute Quarterly of Homophile Studies. Uh, in 1961, Henry Gerber translated two foundational texts from Hirschfeld's great 1,400-page monograph, The Homosexuality of Men and Women. One of them is a text uh, that discusses Hirschfeld's so-called adaptation therapy. He argued that the psychotherapy that, that homosexual and transgender people needed was psychotherapy to help them cope with prejudice and bigotry <laughs> and discrimination <laughs> and to find self-respect and self-confidence that was what they needed therapy for. That was in 1914 mm, wow. that he was making yeah, that nice. argument, and Gerber translated it in 1961 because it remains a very timely mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. uh, as for Hirschfeld himself, uh, he remained deeply committed to all of these goals, to promoting uh, work on behalf of transgender people, on behalf of <coughs> homosexual people. Let's look a little bit about what he did with regard to trans people. Uh, and here we're going to look at the little Get the right place here. This little volume, blank on one side and then with four images on a plate on the other side. Uh, it's a book from 1912 called Erotic Cross Dressing. Set aside what may sound like an odd title to us mm -hmm. for a moment. It's the plates volume for a larger monograph published in 1910 that Hirschfeld put out called The Transvestites. He invented <coughs> the word transvestite. At the time, it was a progressive neologism <coughs> that was meant to do away with negative terminology and to identify the group of people who had <coughs> variations from gender norms and who performed them publicly uh, and to recognize them as a group of people who merited respect, much like queer people, uh, much like homosexuals. Um, and so the book defended not only people who cross-dressed for erotic purposes, but also those we would now recognize as transgender people. These categories were not altogether the way we would think of them now. What the plate shows, and this is a nice little wink to San Francisco, this is a plate showing a German immigrant who came to San Francisco in the 1870s, was assigned male at birth, but arriving in San Francisco presented in public most of the time as a woman. And clearly, we, we would probably now say that this person was gender queer, not necessarily transgender. Kind of went back and forth between the two voluntarily. Uh, so it's quite amazing to have a picture of uh, a gender queer uh, San Franciscan who was <laughs> here in the 1870s. Mm. Uh, and Hirschfeld discusses the case at some length in his big monograph, but not with enough detail yet that we can actually identify the name of the person and get more details on them. Um, so the foundation of Hirschfeld's efforts on behalf of transgender people lay in his advocacy for homosexuals and his evolving thinking about homosexuality. So in the era when the Scientific Humanitarian Committee was founded, uh, sexual desire was seen as invariably involving uh, gender polarity. 
For desire to exist, there had to be a man and a woman, or male and female. That's what made sexual desire. And many people experienced it that way. So Hirschfeld initially thought of homosexuals as what he called a third sex, mm -hmm. as in the title of that pamphlet, and uh, said that they were, that for example, gay men, homosexual men, were a woman's soul in a man's body, and that that explained their desire for other men. Mm. Now, Hirschfeld didn't actually stick with that theory for terribly long because as he did more and more research and met more and more people and gave more and more public talks, and he kept meeting people who didn't fit <laughs> that schema. Uh, he met men who said, no, I don't, I don't want a girl in me. I'm as butch as I come and I want yeah. to sleep with men. And women who were quite feminine wanted to sleep with women. And he saw that he, and he met people who clearly were what we would say were heterosexually identified, but in fact had these gender variations. So he left behind that theory and began to recognize that in fact he needed to separate sexual desire from sense of gender identity and gender performance. Uh, and over time, he increasingly uh, moved in that direction. So by the early, so, so ultimately, the first big step in that was the transvestites, where he started drawing out these group of people as a different <coughs> separate set of people. Ultimately, he engaged in a series of initiatives, including finally at his Institute for Sexual Science, which we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, the Institute was one of the first places where gender confirmation surgeries were performed, starting in the 1920s with men who wanted to be castrated, and starting in the early 1930s using some of the uh, advances in uh, reconstructive surgery that were developed to treat deeply injured people during World War I. Uh, and some of the uh, surgeons at Hirschfeld's Institute began to apply these techniques to actually provide gender <coughs> confirmation surgery for uh, male to female transgender people. Uh, and if any of you saw the film about Lily Elba, the Danish girl, part of Lily Elba's treatment was, uh, was at Hirschfeld's Institute, although that doesn't appear in the fictional film. So what we see between these two polarities, the homosexual advocacy and the transgender advocacy, uh, is a series of developments in Hirschfeld's thinking where he gradually separates three things that had previously been experienced and perceived as being intrinsically linked and necessarily parts of the same thing. So he begins to see uh, biological sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity not as part of a unitary phenomenon, but as three different possibilities that could diverge one from another in a variety of complex ways. Uh, and that is really one of the groundbreaking aspects of Hirschfeld's work. This was not at all, to, uh, to us it seems obvious, but more than 100 years ago, the concept that those things were somehow separate would have been baffling to people, and people didn't even live that way. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, Hirschfeld's observation of people sneaking outside the system helped him understand that it was a system and that it didn't work naturally, or that it was created <laughs> naturally. Let's talk just a touch about the Institute for Sexual Science, which I briefly mentioned. Hirschfeld as a, an MD, and let's point out, he was a bit of a quack MD. Uh, he, wa he, was not a, he wasn't an allopath, he was a naturopath. So he was kind of in the homeopathic end of things and, and water therapy and various natural alternative treatments. He had an MD, but he very much was on the uh, progressive, natural side of things. Uh, Hirschfeld, so he was an MD with a very active practice. Uh, deeply involved in research around issues of sexuality, uh, deeply involved in advocacy with the founding of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, and a variety of other advocacy positions. He was a social democrat, ultimately. Uh, he supported parts of the women's movement, but couldn't really be called a feminist. He was a bit of an old German paterfamilias, ultimately. Mm. Uh, and he was very involved in sexual law reform, well beyond simply the issue of, uh, of the sodomy law. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, against, uh, get, dealing with substance use, dealing with penal reform, dealing with the death penalty, you really had a wide-ranging vision that social justice was needed to bring about change in society and to do away with the misery that people were experiencing and with the corruption that was evident uh, in the ruling classes of German society. Um, so the Institute for Sexual Science, he founded in 1919 in Berlin as an all-purpose sexual health and information and research center. Uh, it offered clinical services, it offered mental health services, it offered reproductive rights and, and uh, birth control and support for pregnant women. Uh, it offered public lectures, sex education courses, uh, it had a, an extensive publication series, it had a museum, archives, and library that were the first in the world 
not to be only about LGBTQ people, but to make LGBTQ people extremely visible. To give you a sense of the Institute and its fame, it really became world famous. Here you're seeing a French magazine from 1930, uh, 32, about secret Berlin, and this spread is entirely about the Institute of Sexual Science. This was a popular weekly illustrated magazine that came out on Sundays, meant that it got bought by the working class, among other folks. Uh, and what you see is some pictures of the Institute, Hirschfeld in his library at the Institute. Down here you see, um, that's <laughs> really distracting. Oh, sorry. Now, down here you see a little photo of the museum, which is quite interesting to note that what you see are a series of people with gender variations. So you see bearded ladies, uh, you see noted butches. Uh, this is the one of women with gender variations as he classified them. So he made LGBTQ lives and experiences a very visible part of his work, even though it wasn't an exclusive part of it. And the numerous books and articles that were written about the Institute at the time, I've read a lot of them, they always mention the queer stuff. Clearly, that's the first thing Hirschfeld took people to see. Mm. And then you got to see the other stuff. So he, he covered everything, but he had a, he had a, a pet clause, and everybody knew that. Uh, so the Institute uh, was uh, a center that attracted visitors worldwide, and we have our own little little link to the Institute in the Elsa Gidlow papers in our archives. Mm -hmm. Elsa was a lesbian poet uh, who started working at, in a lesbian, she published the first book of lesbian poetry in North America in 1922. Right. Uh, she died in 1985, is that right? Mm -hmm. In the mid 80s. Uh, in 1928, she and her fabulously fey little friend, Roswell, were spending the year in Europe, and they went over to Berlin, and in her journal she describes, in November 1928, going and having lunch with Hirschfeld, mm -hmm. and getting a tour of the Institute, and uh, meeting some of the unusual colorful characters who frequented the place. And then, deeply frustrating, the last line in the entry is, next week we're coming back to visit the archives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's no entry about that. <laughs> so either they didn't go or she was busy and didn't write about it, so we didn't get to hear what she says about the archives. But uh, it truly was world famous. If you went to Berlin and you were at all progressive, you had to go visit the Institute. Where else were you going to see something like that? Mm -hmm. Now, the Institute is also the place where we encounter the disaster. So Hirschfeld in the end of the Wilhelmine period, the Weimar, in the Weimar Republic, People in big cities in Germany are feeling like, wow, we've got this queer subculture going, we've got a movement for rights, we've got a bunch of publications, we have theater troops, we have bars, we have clubs, we have advocacy organizations. Things are on the upswing. But of course, Germany was deeply divided and facing extreme economic inequality. And there was a huge rise in ultra-right wing organizing in the 1920s, and we know where that led. Uh, Hirschfeld himself was attacked uh, at a public talk in the 1920s, someone opened fire. Fortunately, he wasn't hit. After another public talk, he was attacked in the street and struck in the head with a rock and left with a concussion. Uh, and he carried on with his work. He didn't stop at all. He was not prepared to be frightened or to be cowed. And if anything, that made him think his work was more valuable and more important. Uh, of course, the fate of the Institute, its library, its archives, Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld saw the rise of Nazism. In 1931, he left Germany for a world tour, in part to get away from the trouble there. And by the time his world tour was over, the Nazis had taken over. So he stayed in exile, mm. initially in Germany, then in Switzerland, and then finally the last two years of his life in France, uh, where he attempted to <coughs> continue his work and restart his work. As for the Institute, Hirschfeld's partner, Karl Giese, who you see one of his partners, as you'll find out later, who you see in this photo uh, giving a lecture in the upper right there. Uh, Karl Giese was a working class kid who was 20 years younger than Hirschfeld. Uh, Christopher Isherwood, the gay novelist, was close friends with Giese, and in his memoirs, uh, Hirschfeld describes Giese as having the heart of a simple country girl. <laughs> <laughs> and, who, and he so was deeply in love with Hirschfeld, who he always referred to as Papa. <laughs> so Giza was there running the institute while Hirschfeld was on tour. The Nazis take over in February 1933. On May 6, 1933, the SA and an organized group of SA-related students 
marched with a marching band to the Institute and annihilated the place. They sacked the Institute. Uh, they carted off the library. Uh, the archives had been placed in hiding. We're not quite sure where they went. The Giza managed to, to stash them somewhere, and we've never managed to trace them. But the library of 12,000 volumes uh, was carted away, and uh, on the 10th of May, 1933, uh, and you can see yeah, in the video there, that. right at this moment, mm -hmm. the famous Nazi book burning that we've all seen footage of, half of what was being burned there was Hirschfeld's Institute Library. Mm -hmm. And this was not a secret, it was part of the public propaganda. The media was invited to the raid on the Institute, and many of the photographs of the book burning, you see people holding up, posing with books that have a picture <coughs> of Hirschfeld or one of his books, uh, it was made very clear that they were doing away with this pro-sex, social democrat, mm. Jew, who ran this filthy institute that was undermining uh, German society in the eyes of the Nazis. And the, the one object that I particularly point you to in this regard, well, you have two. Here you have French coverage of the burning, the book burning, and you can see they portray it as the burning of Dr. Hirschfeld's library. That's how it was portrayed at the time. Pieces fallen out of the library. No one ever mentions half of what was being burned was Hirschfeld's library. Uh, and here you see the raid. Uh, they've pasted Hirschfeld in as if he were there watching the students raiding the thing and the book burning. And then just below we have here a particularly scarce object that I urge you all to take a close look at. This book with a couple of visible rubber stamps. Uh, it's a book of no particular value. It's about prostitution and tuberculosis in Berlin in around 1900. You can get the book itself for $10. It's the artifact that makes it valuable. This is one of approximately 35 books known to have survived the book burning. Ah. Somebody took it home as a souvenir. It was quite chaotic. That would be my guess. It wasn't a lending library. Uh, and there are only two of these books in North America. The other one is in the Treader Collection at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. It only has the call numbers. This one has the rubber stamps that say, Institute for Sexual Science, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld Foundation, with the address given. Uh, so it really is a moment, um, an opportunity to touch one of the darkest moments in Western history of the 20th century, and a moment when the state turned against our calls for social justice and attempted to erase our history, our memory, our knowledge, uh, and to make us uh, disappear in smoke and flames, and of course, very shortly thereafter, homosexual men began to be uh, began to uh, be deported to the concentration camps. All the very first groups sent to the concentration camps were prostitutes, gay men, and communists, uh, all of whom were seen as more vulnerable than some of the other groups that became the main targets. Hirschfeld survived because he was already in exile in France. And he saw in a movie theater that newsreel of the book burning mm. and later described it as being like watching his own funeral. Mm. Uh, picked himself up and tried to carry on in France and reconstitute his institute. Kurt Killer, who was the director of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee at the time, was actually arrested <coughs> and sent to the Oranienburg concentration camp and then accidentally released six months later. So he managed to survive. Mm. Uh, and uh, indeed survived, he died in the 1970s. Mm. But uh, it was a very dark time, the Institute vanished, and in a particularly nasty twist, this document here, you see the cover reproduced, and then this is the actual pamphlet. This is a Nazi propaganda pamphlet called A Struggle for Germany, mainly against horrible communists, but also against sexual filth. And here's Hirschfeld, and here's Giza giving a tour. Particularly nasty, the organization that published this pamphlet, was given the building of the Institute for Sexual Science as its headquarters mm -hmm. uh, to carry on its work suppressing mm -hmm. sexual filth and commies mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, the building ultimately was bombed during World War II and no longer exists, but there is a, a plaque marking the site uh, there in Berlin where it stood. <coughs> Let's take one last theme uh, and to, to end on a note. This is, this is a very dark moment in history, and what we see is that there really was a severe repression of the queer movement, the sexual progress movement, of social progress in general. But I think it's a good time to also remember that at least some people managed to survive, at least some people managed to pass along the memory. And so I think it's nice to, to end this little piece by talking about Hirschfeld as a person and to recognize
this man who did this dauntless, unbelievable work for, for 45 or 50 years of his life, who suffered this terrible blow, uh, and who went on to live for another two years in France in exile, and to actually continue his work, you know, do writing and give interviews, uh, meet with visiting scholars and so on, and he also had a personal life. So Carl Giza managed to escape Germany and joined Hirschfeld in France. And on his world lecture tour, if you see this magazine here, the front cover, on his world lecture tour, Hirschfeld had met uh, a young <coughs> man from Hong Kong, he met him in Shanghai, a young man who was 30 years his junior, <laughs> Li Shutong, who did not normally dress in some kind of traditional Chinese garb. He was a member of the upper class. His grandfather was an admiral uh, in China, uh, very well educated, multilingual, and he became Hirschfeld's other life partner. So Hirschfeld, in the last four or five years of his life, lived a polyamorous private life, and not all that private. Uh, <laughs> but we point out that, that so given the anti-homosexual prejudices of the era, and given Hirschfeld's desire to maintain a certain kind of credibility as a scientist <coughs> and a, as an advocate, he didn't come out and say, I'm queer. Nobody did at that right. time. Conversely, there's a kind of coming out in the era that if you know how to read the signs, Hirschfeld basically came out. So, unlike most highly public figures, he never married, he never had children. He never had a family. He never gave any evidence of having female romantic partners or doing anything that would signal I'm interested in women in that way. Conversely, when the institute opened, he lived openly there in an apartment with Carl Giza. Uh, in France, Carl Giza and Li Chouton lived with him in the same apartment building. Everybody knew, given Hirschfeld's work, given his advocacy, and given his private life, which wasn't terribly private, you would have to have been awfully clueless not to know that he was gay. That was coming out in that time period. You didn't need to declare yourself. There were standards of discretion through which you could be indiscreetly discreet. And Hirschfeld very clearly was. Uh, he was a real sexual radical at a personal level as well. And let me also just mention with Li Chouton, lest there be any confusion, uh, Li Chouton certainly was not some sort of exotic oriental subaltern. He was highly educated, self-directed, had his own money, didn't need Dr. Hirschfeld to take care of him or look after him. In fact, it was the other way around. And uh, at Hirschfeld's death, Li Shutong took charge of Hirschfeld's estate, uh, arranged for his burial, for his marvelous tomb in Nice, uh, settled uh, all of the aspects of his estate. Hirschfeld left all of his belongings and his rights equally to Giza and Li Shutong. They were his family. Uh, and uh, Li Shutong went on to study at medical school in uh, Zurich. And there's even a novel inspired by his life that was published in 1939 by Robert Hilton called uh, That Which Is Hidden, uh, the author of Lost Horizons, who you may know from the 1930s oh. film. So the popular novel in which Li Shutong is the lead character, and Hirschfeld, uh, under, they both have other names as the characters in the books, Hirschfeld appears in flashbacks, it opens with a scene of Li Xutong visiting Hirschfeld's tomb uh, in Nice. Uh, so Li Xutong was actually a, a man of, of considerable self-possession uh, who brought an enormous amount of support uh, to Hirschfeld. Um, let's have a little pause here while I sip some water and hear if there are any questions or comments before we move on to the next. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, um, <coughs> so at the same time as Hirschfeld and this is going on, Wilhelm Reich and the Freudians are also going on. What exactly. was, the was there a relationship uh, between them um, that you're aware of? Yes. Uh, a relationship that was complex and uh, was a bit of a Baroque dance. Oh. <laughs> Hirschfeld Here, Here, initially appreciated Freud and tried kissing up to him a little. And Hirschfeld put out a series of questionnaires that he used in his research that were published. We didn't have room to include one here, two in my collection. And it was usually called the Psychobiological Questionnaire. And one edition was called the Psychoanalytic Sexual Questionnaire. Uh, and only one. Uh, essentially, Hirschfeld reached out to Freud, and Freud pretty clearly was like, who is this kook? Uh, Freud was not an advocate. He was not a social justice advocate. He was not, he was, he was highly respectable and a very proper gentleman, and he was not into all this kind of 
tacky trashy behavior, but here's what's interesting. And in regards to the tacky trashy behavior, it may not be super evident. Well, take a look at these <coughs> magazine newspaper articles. There were no articles like this about Freud. Hirschfeld had a PR agent who was getting him in the press. And he was writing articles for these popular press publications. Uh, he wrote and appeared in a fictional silent melodrama. Now, to us, these look like quaint antiques. But for the time period, these were the cutting edge of modern technology. Mass print culture, cheaply produced, available to cultures where, in Germany, in France, there was universal literacy. People were required to be in grade school up through fifth grade. And that had been the case since the 1880s. So it was the beginning of universal literacy, cheap print production, photographic reproduction in magazines. This was the cutting edge. These were the tweets <laughs> of the 1920s, 1930s. And Hirschfeld was out there to get his message into every new medium. I mean, a silent film is kind of amazing, a silent film melodrama that was pitched to a real kind of working class audience. Uh, Freud didn't appreciate that. And respectable doctors didn't appreciate that. Doctors don't get their hands dirty with all that popular vulgar stuff and talk to ordinary people. Uh, ordinary people come and ring our doorbell and beg for our attention. Uh, here's from the shameless, and uh, thank goodness. Uh, Dr. Know. Oz of his time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, quickly. Uh, on his uh, Freud's uh, memoir of his travels, did he discuss uh, about which city he thought was the most accepting of non-standard sexuality, or did he compare different cities? Or Not really. Uh, he wasn't looking for a competition. His main objective, and this is why the book is a little frustrating for us, the reason he says, I'm here in the beautifully, uh, fabulously beautiful harbor of San Francisco, he's about to sail for the Orient. <laughs> so he'd been in the U.S. for three months, and he doesn't say anything about that. Uh -huh. Because the main objective of the book was to demonstrate that there was a great diversity of sexual practices, of gender identities and gender performances, of forms of desire outside of the industrialized Western world where the argument was, well, that was, those things were produced by the decadence yeah, right. and the luxury of the Western industrialized world. And out there where people were natural and had ancient cultures, mm -hmm. you wouldn't see any of that. And so Hirschfeld's book is basically saying, well, really, how about this, how about this, how about this, how about this? <laughs> Uh, he was, was undermining, without ever saying it explicitly, enough with this nonsense about Western decadence. Uh, this isn't decadence at all. It's natural. It's part of natural human variation. You see it across cultures, across time, across people. Uh, so he, doesn't, he isn't out to kind of set up a competition. He's out to set up a broad argument against the idea <coughs> that sexual and gender diversity were somehow a form of, of illness or, or of degradation. Um, what was his cause of death, or why did he die? He died of a heart attack on his 67th birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, he had come back from his world tour with malaria. Mm -hmm. He was diabetic. Uh, he had a notorious sweet tooth. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, and 67 at that point in time, well, you know, you were getting on in years. Uh, and at that point, he had lived in Paris for a year and a half, and then he uh, <coughs> retired to the French Riviera. And although Hirschfeld was in exile, and that was no picnic, We'll talk a little bit about the fact that he wasn't in exile and in economic misery. And we'll talk about that a little later. You can imagine he, he, lived in, he lived in Paris in an apartment where you looked out and it was the Champ de Mars and the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. And across the street is the Champ de Mars. It's super <laughs> swanky in the south of the arrondissement. And in Nice, he lived in an apartment building where he looked out his window across a large private garden for the apartment building he was in. And then there was the Promenade des Anglais and mm -hmm. the Mediterranean. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he had a rather uh, pleasant places to stay in exile, at least physically pleasant. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions there, back there. Um, so that kind of leads into my question a little bit, not personally, but in terms of the <laughs> Ill illegality of the sodomy laws and the other acts and being on the fringe of science, how did he fund his work and specifically the library and the archives where I, I, there's not a network of rich days yes. all over we'll, there. We'll talk about that when I get to this. Things that didn't get into the show. Mm. <laughs> yes. Um, so you said that uh, the press were invited to go watch the library get torn down, etc. So did, did, so did they, was there enough lead time that people knew to get out of the building? Um, mm. Is anyone in it? At least one person was in it, my dear friend Ralph Doza, who, who founded and runs the Magnus Hirschfeld Society in Berlin, he's been running it for 40 years. He had a chance to interview one of the maids who worked at the institute, and she was there when it was raided. So they didn't beat up the people who were there. 
Uh, but it was quite a nasty raid, and the maid uh, was, was devastated. She'd worked there for years. She loved Dr. Hirschfeld. And when she came to the interview with uh, Ralph, she gave him Hirschfeld's inkwell, which the essay had thrown to the floor. And she picked it up and put it in her apron and kept it with her for, <laughs> for 50 years and then gave it to the Hirschfeld Society. Uh, so there was, it, it, once the, I mean, the Nazis took over in February, and already people at the Institute could see the handwriting on the wall. That's why Giza was trying to figure out how to get the archives to safety. Uh, and some of the artifacts have, have survived, but uh, and a few of the books, but largely uh, the collection has vanished. Mm -hmm. So another yeah. question there? Okay. Yes. What happened to the hidden archive? Never found? Was lost during the war? Yeah, we don't, we don't know with all of the troubled years of, of the war. Uh, what we know is that Giza said that he had managed to preserve the archives in safety somehow. Hirschfeld had an enormous storage unit in Paris. Mm. And he left it to Giza and Michoutong, and we have no idea what happened to the contents of it. Giza uh, was kicked out of France after he was caught in a tea room raid. And so he went into exile, uh, first in Austria, the Nazis took over. He fled to Czechoslovakia, the Nazis took over, mm. he committed suicide in 1938. Mm. Apparently, in part because of the stress of being chased from place to place, but also because he had a heartbreaking break up with his boyfriend of the time. Uh, so we don't know what became of Giza's part. Mm. Li Xu Tong, uh, Ralph, traced him into the 1950s to Canada and then lost track of him. Didn't know for years where he went. And then about uh, 12 years ago, the Hirschfeld Society received an email from a gentleman in Canada saying, oh, you know, 10 years ago I was the, the concierge at a big apartment building and one of the residents got, died and they told me to take the junk he left in his apartment out and it was so interesting, I kept it. It was two suitcases full of Li Xu Tong's memorabilia of Hirschfeld. Mm. So he had died in Canada in his 80s, in 1993, before oh, they managed to find him. Oh, wow. And this gentleman mm. said, hey, I see you have a society to commemorate this old German doctor, and you want this stuff? And he just gave it to me. I mean, this is worth, as a rare book dealer, I can tell you, that was quite a donation. Mm -hmm. It includes the only surviving volume of Hirschfeld's manuscript journals, Mm -hmm. It includes a plaster death mask of Hirschfeld. We didn't know anyone had made one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really just a treasure trove. And from there, Ralph could ultimately find Li Xutong's family, his younger brother, is still alive. And the family had another couple of trunks of material that was not as interesting, and they sold it to the Hirschfeld Institute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was one of the appraisers mm -hmm. <laughs> who came up with a fair value for it. Uh, so, here some material continues to emerge. Mm. If only we had found Li Xu Tong while he was still alive. Yeah. It would have been so marvelous to hear his stories and his perspective. So uh, keep looking. I, I, I scout frequently in Europe, and I keep thinking sooner or later someone's going to find a barn with <laughs> all the junk from Hirschfeld's storage locker tucked away there. You just never know. I mean, things mm. turn up. This, the book that survived the book burning was offered by a dealer on the internet about 15 years ago. Mm. And he had the good sense to mention the rubber stamp. But I don't think he really understood what it meant, mm. given what I paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Which city in Canada? Uh, he was in uh, Toronto, hmm. and he's buried there. Uh, so if you go to Toronto, pay, a, pay mm. homage at the tomb of Michu Tong, who really supported Hirschfeld yeah, in a major absolutely. way in his final years. Um, let's just do a couple of quick stories about some of the items in the show. So I've already mentioned this one, and it was quite a surprising find on the internet. Uh, if you look assiduously, it is intriguing, the things that you can discover. Oh, yeah. Let me point to just a couple of other items. One other one with a wink to San Francisco that isn't mentioned in the label. The so Institute for Sexual Science published an annual scholarly publication called the Yearbook of Sexual Intermediate Types mm -hmm. with a particular focus on homosexuality, uh, which is quite a short title for an academic journal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and here you're seeing volume two, 1900. It published until 1922. And the reason I selected this as the example is that you see this frontispiece of this very stately and stern looking woman. Uh, Rosa Bonheur was a famed French academic painter who did enormous paintings of rural scenes, notably cows and horses. Enormous as in as big as this wall. Uh, very, very celebrated painter. Uh, made tons of money. And because she had to go out in the fields and paint cows, she had to get special permission to wear men's clothes all the time. 
<laughs> and she just incidentally smoked a pipe while she was doing it. That was it. She was a big old butch. And she had a series of pretty lovely femme girlfriends. Her last pretty lovely femme girlfriend for the last 20 years of her life was a woman named Anna Klumpke. Anna Klumpke was born in San Francisco. She was also an academic painter. And uh, when uh, Rosa Bonheur died, she inherited her huge estate to set up a foundation and ultimately moved back to San Francisco for the last nine or ten years of her life. She died in 1936. The house that she lived in in uh, the sunset is still there. And it was here that she wrote her memoirs about her life with Rosa Bonheur. So we have both a look at the lesbian, at that wonderful gender queerness that was already happening, that butch femme culture, and a little wink to San Francisco that isn't mentioned there uh, uh, with Anna Klumpke. And the most famous, couple most famous portraits of Rosa Bonheur are by Anna Klumpke. So uh, Klumpke's house deserves a plaque. Uh, let's look at one more uh, before we move on to our little show and tell, and then we'll be done. So here, looking at Hirschfeld's, the destruction of Hirschfeld's Institute, Hirschfeld in exile. Here is a copy of the last of Hirschfeld's books published during his lifetime. He was hugely prolific, not a terribly good writer. It's not, <laughs> it's not beautiful style, but he just had a message to get out 24 hours a day. He must have written in the bathtub and in his bed and in his sleep. <laughs> there was an unbelievable the amount of, of publications he produced. Jim uh, Stakely, the emeritus professor from uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, it has been working for years on a comprehensive bibliography of Hirschfeld, and he keeps saying, well, it's never going to be done. <laughs> stuff keeps showing up. Uh, <laughs> and the translations and the variations. Of, so this was the last book published in his lifetime. I'm particularly proud to be able to say that because we didn't know for sure. Normally, it was published in French. It was the only one of his books never published in German. Mm. Published in 1935. He died on May 15th, 1935. Normally, French books have a little thing called the National Vidan Primé that indicates the exact date of publication. Published on May 27, 1932, the three books of Hirschfeld in French in 1935 just say, published in 1935, was it before or after his death? Hmm. Um, and ultimately, I found a copy that had the publisher's advertising prospectus tucked mm -hmm. inside that gave the exact date of publication. Uh -huh and then a copy that had a little card tucked inside that said, sent to you by the author who is not currently in Paris. Mm. And then I found this copy inscribed by Hirschfeld mm. three weeks before his death in Nice to a fellow German exile, uh, to, uh, to my uh, very esteemed uh, director Grüner, we don't know who that is, with best immigration wishes mm. uh, from the author Dr. M. Hirschfeld, Nice, uh, the 25th of April, 1935. And he wrote it in French? Uh, he wrote it in German. And then it was... The, uh, the, well, the, you know, Hirschfeld's French was okay. His English was much better. He worked with a number of collaborators, including his nephew, who was quite good in French. So this one, he probably <coughs> sat down with his collaborators and talked about what he wanted and showed them bits and pieces. And uh, so uh, it's called The Psychology of Love. And it's quite, it's really, it's a kind of, anti-marriage manual, because it's all about sexual fulfillment and women deserve fulfillment as much as men and stop bossing your wife around. It's this really queer vision of how heterosexuals ought to live their lives. <laughs> it's quite fascinating. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is an English translation that was brought out. Uh, and this also is particularly touching for me because I had the honor uh, in uh, 2010 uh, of taking part in the delegation to the cemetery in Nice on the 75th anniversary of Hirschfeld's death. Uh, as a little collector, starting in my mid-twenties, I said, mm -hmm. I love this Hirschfeld guy, he's such a fantastic group, and he's so energetic, and he's promoting all these things I love, and I'm gonna visit his tomb one day. And finally, with that anniversary coming up, I set a deadline, and I was on the board of a French national organization that works to commemorate queer victims of the Nazis. So we got together and planned programs in five different cities in mm -hmm. Paris, produced a little booklet about Hirschfeld and his career, and then a for the French love is a formal delegation to the cemetery with elected officials and union leaders <laughs> carrying wreaths and so on. And what I did was I took that book back to Nice, and the introduction Hirschfeld talks about how grateful he is to the French for welcoming mm. him in exile and his dreams for what he might accomplish now that he's been chased from his homeland and now that his life work has been destroyed and how he hopes to be able to, to return to this work and to share his knowledge with the French in gratitude for their welcome to him. And uh, he died less than a month 
after the book came out. So I read that passage mm -hmm. uh, from the book at Hirschfeld's tomb to sort of bring him back, uh, back home. Uh, if you're ever in Nice, be sure to visit the cemetery. The tomb is spectacular. It says Art Deco marble. Incredibly simple and beautiful. And the bodily the bust of Hirschfeld uh, that you see there, the profile of Hirschfeld by the German sculptor Arnold Zadikoff is quite lovely. Zadikoff died in the Theresienstadt concentration camp. Mm -hmm. You can also visit the tomb of Serge Voronov, who was a sort of a really sexual quack doctor who implanted um, monkey testicles mm -hmm. onto aging men to restore their sexual manhood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and of course, nieces, nieces were a lot of rich people were hanging out, so they were there to get the miracle treatment <laughs> of the monkey. Um, any questions at this point? Then we'll do a quick little wrap up by doing a show and tell of things that couldn't go into the, the show. Questions, comments? Yes, Jerry. The 1,200-page work, has that ever been translated into English? 1,400 pages. 1400. And the wonderful Michael Lombardi Nash uh -huh. translated. It was published about 15 years ago. You can find copies used online in the $50 to $100 range. It was published by a small academic publisher. Michael also translated the 1910 volume, The Transvestites. So that's available as well. Uh, and really, Hirschfeld's Homosexuality of Men and Women from 1914, if you are interested in queer history, just pick it up and read a few pages once in a while. It is a gold mine. Hirschfeld was not a super good synthesizer. He was all about, let's put in everything we possibly know and can possibly find about this and jam it in there. It has several sections where he talks about San Francisco. Uh, how he heard when he was in, in the United States in the 1890s, he heard from someone in Chicago that San Francisco was a pretty good town to pick up soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so he basically was just trying to give you everything he had found out about homosexuality in one giant book. So that makes it kind of hard reading, but it's a gold mine of, of fascinating tidbits and leads off to other interesting stuff and a great bibliography. Mm -hmm. Let's do our quick little show and tell, and then we'll wrap up. So what, what we couldn't include in the show that I think is important to remember, and we'll look at this publication as a way of mentioning that, is Hirschfeld didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, there were pioneers already doing work starting in the, depending on how far back you look, but in Germany, starting in the early 19th century. Uh, and certainly in the mid-19th century, you have the figure of Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, mm -hmm. who invented this theory of the third sex, the woman's soul in the man's body. Ulrichs was a lawyer uh, in Hanover uh, who was a big Marianne and was trying to explain his own manners and his own desires, and he came up with this elaborate theory of, the, of souls being mismatched with bodies. And he proceeded to launch a campaign to get people to recognize this and, and to do away with laws persecuting queer people. He published a series of 12 little booklets uh, called Studies in Man, Manly Love. He sent copies to every member of the German parliament. You can imagine how much they appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he is, as far as you know, the first person to stand up in public and say, I'm a sodomite. He did it at a German, at a Hanover, the meeting of the Hanover Association of Lawyers. Oh and he only got about five minutes into his talk before being booed off the stage. Uh, but it was in 1868, he got up there and said it. Uh, really quite an amazing character. It's quite a privilege for me to be able to show you this little publication. This is the first edition of one of Carl mm. Heinrich Ulrichs's mm. Advocacy publications. The first two he used a pseudonym, Numa Numantius. This is one of those two. Then he started putting his own name on it. Uh, the German National Library does not own this publication. <laughs> and uh, I received it as a gift from Ulrich's American biographer, Hubert Kennedy. Uh, and his expanded version of his biography is online for free. Go look for Hubert's website. It's quite a fantastic book. And he couldn't find a publisher for the new edition. How do you spell It's Carl with a K, Heinrich. U-L-R-I-C-H-S, -L Carl Henry Ulrichs. So Hirschfeld was much influenced by the advocacy and the effort to theorize that Ulrichs put forward. And you can see that because, we'll move on to another fantastic little find, no telling what will turn up on the internet. Here's the second edition of one of Ulrichs's books. Hirschfeld edited the 12 books and had them reprinted in 1898 by Max Spohr, the great publisher of the early, early German homosexual emancipation movement. Uh, it's kind of entertaining because Hirschfeld edited out the really kooky parts. <laughs> of course, you know, what Hirschfeld regarded as really kooky versus what wasn't really kooky, well, <laughs> that's probably something that we all might have very opinions about. 
Uh, so here you see the second edition. What makes this particularly nice is, so I ordered this off the internet from a, from a dealer in England, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, who just knew it was some old, weird German sex book, so I paid basically nothing for it. He didn't mention the binding, he didn't mention the owner's signature, and he thoughtfully did not erase the marginalia written inside the book. Binding is BSS Library, the British Sexological Society, founded by Edward Carpenter, the great, by the great Edward Carpenter, the great early English uh, advocate of the intermediate sex and a socialist and a feminist, a really major figure. This is Carpenter's personal copy, signed mm. oh my God. Carpenter. And there's a section of two pages extensively annotated in German and English by Carpenter. It is the section that he translated for the appendix of his mm. book, The Intermediate Sex. Mm. So this is the copy Carpenter used mm. to carry those ideas of Ulrichs via Hirschfeld into the English language. Mm. Uh, Which made its way to the United States. And Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, the Intermediate Sex was widely published in, in, in it was published in Australia, in South Africa, in the United States. <laughs> it was really one of the first texts in the English speaking world that was widely published that advocated on behalf of seeing the intermediate sex homosexual people as a natural variation. Oh. Now people ask about how did Hirschfeld earn his money? We all know about Viagra and such things. <coughs> Hirschfeld produced a quack medicine called Titus Pearls. They were pearly, shiny, black, or you could get a black liquid. And they were a miracle sexual health restorer. <laughs> so if you were having erectile dysfunction, or your wife didn't have enough desire, or any of the various things that you might regard as sexual dysfunction, you took Titus Pearls. And a series of little booklets were produced to send out to pharmacists to convince them to carry these things. Here showed me stacks of money on them. Here's the German booklet. Here's the French booklet. Here's the Swiss booklet, no, here's the Belgian booklet. Uh, there was an American one published. It briefly was sold in the United States until it was banned by the post office, which said, well, there's no evidence that this actually works. Mm. And so it's a fraud, and you can't do it. No one's ever found a copy of the English booklet yet, but I'm looking. Mm. Uh, and Hirschfeld had the good sense to invest a whole lot of his money in the Netherlands. So when the Nazis took over, he cashed out and uh, carted his money away with him. It was not primarily in Germany. He had already at that point handed the mm. Institute for Sexual Science over to the German state as a foundation. Uh, so he no longer owned it. Uh, so Hirschfeld did not live in poverty. He lived in exile and in, in great grief and sorrow, but not in poverty. I've been to the apartment buildings in Paris and in Nice where he lived, and they are swank. They are in the very fanciest parts of town. Really, really uh, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> apartment building, so Hirschfeld did okay. Uh, and this is where most of his money came from. Mm. The infatigable mm. Ralph Doza of the Hirschfeld Society, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, the company that produced this drug was, was nationalized by the Nazis. So they kept selling it, they just took Hirschfeld's name off. Mm. So in the 20s, you would go to a pharmacy and there'd be a big cardboard cutout of Dr. Hirschfeld, assuring you that this was the best sexual health medicine. Mm. Nazis take over, no more Hirschfeld, but they kept selling it. And then when East Germany took over, they nationalized the company and kept selling it. Oh. It finally went out of business sometime in the 50s, the drug, but the company was still in business. Ralph's like, where are your old business records? Oh, they're all in the barn out. They had all the business records from the 1920s and 1930s. He could find exactly how much money Hirschfeld made. He found the actual formula for this stuff. We could mix up a batch. <laughs> we have a lot of crazed history sleuths around here. Uh, sorry, but if it were some kind of history sleuth uh, wrestling match, Ralph would whoop all of us. <laughs> He's done a really good job. So, <clears throat> the Institute worked widely for sexual reform, not just to do away with, with um, the law banning sodomy between men. Uh, and so here is a book edited by Hirschfeld in his capacity as head of the Institute of Sexual Science on the reform of sexual law, proposing a whole range of reforms that were needed to make sexual law more humane, more respectful of diversity, more supportive of vulnerable and fragile people, less inclined to uh, uphold rape culture and patriarchy. Uh, and. Uh, this was one of the sort of professional things. So it's interesting to see that Hirschfeld, even though he was regarded by some as a bit of a quack, he was also regarded quite seriously. It's a complex story. This is another case where you never know what you'll get on the internet. This one came along, and it has a lovely rubber stamp that tells us it's from the Reichsjustice Ministry of the Weimar Republic, from their library. And so there's their rubber stamp that was 
mm -hmm. and in activity until, until the Nazis took over in 1933 when it was replaced wow. with an um, eagle holding a, a swastika. So that's kind of fun to have an ex-library copy from the German Justice Ministry. The other way Hirschfeld made money, and we'll close with this. Uh, and Frank, I love Hirschfeld because he had a goal, he had a mission, and he was not going to let anything, including respectability, get in his way. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is we know that social change in difficult, in periods of extreme repression, in difficult times, is not carried out by respectable people. Mm -hmm. Respectable people are busy being respectable, and figuring out how to keep their heads down, how to fit in. It's people who just can't bring themselves to be respectable and are not about to respect a system that is persecuting them and to be complicit in it. Uh, so Hirschfeld also, in the 20s and into the early 30s, brought out a series. I mean, there, there are probably 20 of these kinds of titles. This is um, Sex and Crime. And look at this fantastic, popular, sort of, uh, you know, expressionist dust jacket. It's really a marvelous book. And in fact, it's unlikely that Hirschfeld wrote any of this, except perhaps the introduction. He sold his name, he licensed it as a brand to these popular productions. It's, it's extensively illustrated, as you can imagine. Because what's the point if there are no like, pictures that go, ooh, look at that. And there are a whole series of these. The, if this one's very really rare, but a number of them are not. His book on, this, on the two-volume set on the, on the sexual history of the World War, World War I, you can get the two volume set in pretty good condition for a hundred bucks. Because they were really popular publishing. There were huge numbers of them printed. Mm -hmm. They were widely bought. Uh, they're not rare. Uh, they have fantastic illustrations. Just the thing of the long copy table. Uh, <laughs> so that was Hirschfeld's <laughs> other way of earning money. And then he earned money by giving talks. Uh, he funded his whole world tour basically by going around and getting people to pay him to come to different cities and give talks. Uh, and mm -hmm. we've yet to reconstruct every place he went in the United States. His unpublished journal that was found by by the gentleman in Toronto does give us a bit of a kind of outline. That's what allowed me to find out that which talks he gave in San Francisco and that he gave one in California Hall, uh, which he calls California Hotel on Larkin Street. So clearly it's <laughs> California Hall. <laughs> uh, so if you're a collector, and I urge people to collect, I mean, there's great stuff to be found on the internet, and this is how our history comes together. We couldn't have done this show mm -hmm. for long. Uh, I'm only one of the crazed collectors in our midst, and uh, if you're willing to get out there and look and sniff around assiduously, it's amazing what turns up. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, the book from Hirschfeld's Institute, that was on my wish list as a collector for 30 years, and I didn't think I would ever see one. I never thought I would find one. Or a Hirschfeld inscribed mm -hmm. copy, very hard to find. Mm -hmm. So now I'm on the track of the English language quack medicine pamphlet, and I want an actual little box of Titus pearls. Yes. <laughs> yeah. sure. Every time I go to some collectibles show in Europe, it's like, okay, who are people who sell like old, you know, gran granny's consumer products from the 1920s and 1930s? And it's like the baking soda, the canned soup. Mm. Someday I'm going to find some Titus pearls in there. <laughs> <laughs> Any fresh questions, folks who haven't had a chance yet, please? I just want to make a comment. Uh, I was involved in publishing a magazine called Magnus here in San Francisco in the 70s. We had two issues. Of, uh, in honor of Hirschfeld. You chose the name. Here, here. I love to see Hirschfeld's memory being carried on. For me, he's one of the figures that everybody on earth should know about. And yet, he remains fairly little known. There's an international cult of Hirschfeld. Truly international and truly, we're all kind of crazed about it. Mm. But kids don't learn about Hirschfeld in school. They should. Mm. We had a group of German visitors here this summer. This is where they learned about Hirschfeld. Mm. 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 They told me, oh, we've never heard of this guy before. This is so interesting. Wow. So we have our work cut out for us. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorian, do you have Claudia? Uh, yeah. Do you want to comment on uh, the transparent show? Oh, well, I haven't seen it. and. Um, I was one of several people they invited to be consultants and ultimately decided that they weren't going to use any consultants. Mm. <laughs> so they just made it up. Mm. Ralph and me and Mel Gordon and a few other folks, uh, they didn't like what a historical consultant would do. So mm. I'm glad pe more people will know about Hirschfeld. Now I hope they go and actually learn about Hirschfeld mm. Mm. Uh, now that they've heard his name. Yes? Um, you talked about some early uh, 19th century antecedents. Yes. Uh, there was a Swiss author called Heinrich Rosli who did uh, two volumes on uh, uh, love between men in the ancient world in which mm -hmm. he really took all of those texts about 
about homosexuality in ancient Greece and Rome and translated them into the vernacular language in German and made them available to folks in general and said, well, look how normal this is. In that way, Europe. Was that was yeah. in, the, in 1820 was the first volume. I've only seen one of them at the, French, at the French National Library. It's quite scarce. And then there were a series of people who you might think of as maybe not so pro-queer, but really they kind of were. So Kraft, the great Richard von Kraft Ebbing, mm -hmm. one of the first uh, sexual psychologists and sexologists who did, did a book called Psychopathia Sexualis, Sexual Psychopathy. But in fact, over this series of 12 editions, he moved away from talking about queers as being weird and ill, and increasingly towards letting them simply tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and he published these long passages from their autobiographies and said, well, we just need to observe these people. Uh, my friend um, Harry Osterhaus, who is a scholar in the Netherlands, had the smarts uh, 20 years ago to go to Vienna and start calling every craft ebbing in the phone book hmm. and say, hey, are you related to the craft ebbing? And he found the right ones and they had all of craft ebbing's files in the attic still. Wow. So the things craft ebbing kept when he retired, including about 100 of his case studies, yeah. and Raoul could compare, did the text written by the person about their own life, did craft ebbing touch it up and change it and edit it? <coughs> no, he just let them talk directly through his book. And we know from other texts at the time that increasingly uh, gay men and lesbians would read Kraft Ebbing, read past the psychopathy, and find people like themselves and say, oh, I'm not so strange. Oh, there are other people who have these feelings. So if you could read through the grill of psychopathy, it was empowering in certain ways. Oh, what year was that, though? Oh, I don't remember the exact date of the first edition of Psychopathia Sexualis. It's in the 1870s. Yeah, I want to say 79, but I might Something be wrong. Something like that. And then 12 yeah. editions, 12 revised editions were published during yeah. Kraft Ebbing's lifetime. And it was translated fairly quickly into English in yeah. the 1880s. Yeah. Uh, and numerous editions then have come out there as well. So many of those sort of sexologists, psychologists types in the early 19th century, mid 19th century were actually taking a somewhat, you can't say it was pro-day, but it certainly wasn't a persecutory uh, point of view. Yes. You said he coined the word transvestite, which is new to me. Is that the root word vestment and trans? It's, like a, it's, a, La it's a Latin root. It's cross dress. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, if you use a nice Latin word like that in German, it sounds much more scientific. <laughs> it's not yeah. so down to earth German. I never ever thought because of its it's, you know, it's exactly. this little volume is Erotische Verkleidungstrieb, which is erotic cross dressing, but in German it sounds much more like <laughs> <laughs> it's not fancy and scientific. <laughs> yes. So to bring up a, another sort of something that was going on at the same time, and I don't believe they got along, Die Eigen. In ah. Germany, a whole other movement celebrating male male relationships. Exactly, I should have brought in a, 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 an adult <laughs> front yeah, publication. Right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. That, that's yeah. good. Next time I'll be doing that too. So there were actually two movements, uh, or more, depending on the time period in Germany, uh, starting around 1900. Uh, Der Eigena started before the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. It was a cultural circle of, of elevated male friendship. <laughs> drawing on the tradition of German enlightenment masculinity. Mm -hmm. And it was a bunch of misogynists, mm -hmm. uh, aristocrats or aristocrats wannabe. And their argument was not, this is a natural variation and maybe we have some lady stuff in us. It was, uh, we're men and we're aristocrats and who are you to think you can tell us what we're going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we don't care what you think. Our privilege allows us to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a smaller group. Uh, and a bit kooky, but it published in a very beautiful, long-running publication called Der Eigener. Uh, the San Francisco Public Library has the beautiful deluxe 1906 volume, which I sold them with an embossed cover and gorgeous pictures, <laughs> including some male nudes taken in San Francisco in 1906. Mm. Uh, they're reproduced in, in Der Eigener in Germany. So that group ran alongside. They briefly worked together, but ultimately uh, they decided they couldn't stand each other because they fundamentally were quite different. Der Eigener was cultural, reactionary, and about asserting privilege, and Hirschfeld was scientific, egalitarian, and about asserting the naturalness of a wide range of um, mm -hmm. sexual behaviors, not masculine male homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So they really didn't get along too well. Uh, and um, <coughs> Adolf Braun, the founder of Der Eigener, did not go into exile when the Nazis took over. It's speculated that he probably had a protector in the Nazi party, 
His publishing house was raided and the stock was seized, and ultimately he and his wife were killed in, a, in an Allied air raid on Berlin. Uh, so it's a complex story. I mean, there's a third group uh, called the Society for Human Rights, went, whence the name for the group in Chicago, <coughs> that really followed the model of the Society for Individual Rights in San Francisco. It was kind of middle of the road. <coughs> it had, at one point, it had almost 40,000 members. Mm. As a member, you got the magazine with naked pictures in it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which is kind of like Vector in San Francisco in some ways. <laughs> and among the members was Ernst Röhm, mm. the founder of the SA, yeah. and Hitler's second in command until the 9-1 months when he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a complex series of different movements at the time. One or two more questions. Then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to urge you not only to join the museum, but be sure to buy a lovely postcard of that issue of Voila. And we have a little souvenir booklet that actually has a lot of information that mm -hmm. isn't in the show, a great including booklet. a whole section about Kirchhoff's visit to San Francisco. So please consider buying that, and I'll be happy to inscribe copies if you'd like me to do so. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> yeah.